Hello and welcome to Big Band Exchange. We will begin momentarily, but as you can see, I'm here in our beloved Mel Lassman Square in Toronto and I'm thrilled to introduce to you this new exciting online program. I'm Danielle Anguera with Cinematoscape, an award-winning arts and film company here in North York, and I'm here with my partner. Hello, I'm Simeon Taule. For the past 25 summers, big bands have been filling this square with the sounds of swing. And big bands have enticed hundreds of people to dance and enjoy time together every Sunday evening. We had a great time last year and we're so looking forward to seeing you this summer. Even though right now we can't meet in person, we can still celebrate the joy of music. That's right, in this big band exchange, we are celebrating music by connecting, sharing our love of music, telling stories, exchanging information, and of course, playing our favorite tunes. We wouldn't be here today, or you there, without North York Arts. North York Arts is an art service organization that collaborates with artists and organizations to promote arts programming in North York. This series features four favorite big bands that would have played live right here on this very stage this summer. The members of these unique bands have reached out to music lovers across Toronto and exchanged musical ideas, anecdotes, and memories. Now you have a chance to enjoy it all as they swap the stage for our favorite medium, the screen. Of course, we have one last important point to recognize before the big band exchange begins. Please let us recognize and acknowledge that each of us is joining from different parts of Turtle Island and Indigenous people have been here since time immemorial. This specific land here in North York is covered by Treaty 13. It is the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We are truly grateful to live and create on this land. We wish to thank generations who have cared for the land before, those who continue to and be knowledge keepers of this land today. North York Arts recognizes that this land acknowledgement is part of a continuous process towards truth and reconciliation. We also acknowledge that we're in a time where systemic racism continues to be enacted on both the Indigenous and Black communities. But by adhering to North York Arts values, we will lead with authenticity and we remain committed to building positive relationships with Indigenous people, Black communities, and the many other communities who also face systemic racism, other forms of oppression and marginalization. We remain committed to building positive relationships with the wider community and the environment. We thank you and thank you for acknowledging this time with us today. We are about to hand it over to the band. I don't know about you, but I feel the excitement of the event about to start. From all of us to all of you, take care, be safe and enjoy the Big Band Exchange. If you could spend time doing something you had a passion for, and do it with people you admire and whose company you enjoy, and if you could share that experience with other people, well, you'd be an advocate. Over the next hour, we share our story with you, starting with how we discovered big band music. What was it that drew each of us to this genre? Perhaps it was the music of our childhood, or maybe it made us want to get up and dance. It could have been a particular instrument that beckoned to us at a young age. Or was it the vibrant and infectious rhythms, that powerful foot-stomping mix of jazz and swing? 
The answers lie in the following compilation of personal anecdotes and memories from some of our band members of how they discovered this fantastic music and then found their way to the Advocats Big Band. You will also learn of the joy of being part of a group of engaged and, well, delightful musicians. Throughout the video, you will be treated to excerpts from the music of our recently recorded album, In Full Swing. By the end, you will know how the Advocats Big Band came to be, and what explains the energy and excitement that captivates our audiences. You know, what brought me to big band music is kind of a curious thing. Um, I didn't take music in high school. I started learning how to play the trumpet when I was 18. And um, my listening experience in terms of my formative years was not jazz or, or any kind of uh, big band music. It was hip hop, R&B, and reggae. Um, and so... In my experience, particularly of listening to hip hop, I would be really fascinated at the sounds that artists of that time would utilize in sampling jazz records. And that was happening a lot in hip hop in the 90s. So that was really the thing that kind of piqued my interest. I just wanted to share my my story about how I got into big band. Um, so basically, I was a teenager in high school. And uh, I was listening to a lot of uh, the Beatles and that sort of music. And a friend of mine suggested I listen to Buddy Rich. And they asked me if I knew who Buddy Rich was, and I said no. And uh, they said to me, okay, well, if you listen to Buddy Rich and you don't get goosebumps, then you're not a drummer. So after hearing that, I was intrigued. And I thought to myself, that's a pretty bold statement. So. Naturally, I wanted to listen, so I uh, picked up a record of my dad's, and it was Buddy Rich Plays, 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 and I put it on, and the first song was uh, You Gotta Try, and sure enough, I got goosebumps, and from then on, I was hooked. The big band was, was my favorite thing. Uh, I am relatively late to the big band scene, uh, as a high school student in the 1970s, uh, I was a tuba player. In fact, I still am a tuba player. And um, the high school I went to had great band, but our teacher was fairly conservative. And as a tuba guy, he wouldn't even let me audition for the jazz band, let alone play with them. So I had no access to being able to play with a big band, um, but I loved the music. Always have, I still do. Obviously, I, I play it every chance I get. Uh, I, it makes me happy. I love watching people dance, and uh, my parents played it at home, so it was all around me. But luckily for me, I had uh, an English teacher in the school who was a, an avid jazz saxophone player, 
and I approached him and so he taught me how to read chord symbols and um, how to create a bass line and we started a Dixieland band. So my introduction to jazz as a musician was really in very traditional um, early jazz music and not big band playing. But now I am playing big band stuff, which is my dream, and I'm loving it every day. I think I was about uh, 12 or 13 years old. We were going to, I was going to a brand new junior high school uh, in North York, and I had put down on one of my options as a music option. But in September, we found out that because it was a brand new school, the instruments that had been placed on order had not arrived yet. So all the music students were put into vocal classes. After a while, the instruments did arrive and uh, I was given the baritone or euphonium that uh, is a, s a small tuba type instrument uh, playing in the bass clef. And so I played uh, the uh, baritone for a while. And then when I went to uh, uh, the high school, which was attached and the same music teacher said, uh, well, you know, you've been in the concert band, uh, we're going to form a dance band and I'd like you to join. So, but then he said, well, you know, the baritone doesn't look so great in a dance band. Why don't you learn the trombone? So I learned the trombone and we had a great time. We played a, a lot of Glenn Miller type uh, songs and uh, it was really fun. I want to tell you about my first live experience with big bands. It took place in grade six. And at a school assembly, the local high school came in with their big band, and I saw for the very first time this kind of music and live performance, and I was sold. Couldn't wait to get to high school to start saxophone. And when I got there, I also had the opportunity to see Phil Nimmons in 9 plus 6 and the Stan Kenton Orchestra in performance as part of after-school concerts for students. Both of these legendary musical performers understood how important it was for kids like me to see this kind of music live and in performance. When I was very young, like very young, like I was maybe three years old, we had a family friend that owned a company that supplied records for those old jukeboxes. I don't know if you remember those old Wurlitzer jukeboxes that you see in films uh, every once in a while. Well, this guy would supply the records and when they got old and outdated, he would have to switch them over to the more recent ones and the old ones he would put into his warehouse. He gave us a whole stack of 78 RPM records um, from many years before. And we happened to have an old 78 uh, record player that was able to play that format. Every day I would take a, a new record and I would put it on. Uh, I figured out how to use the machine, I guess. and. Uh, I would play and I would have a favorite record of the day. And uh, so my early records uh, recollections were the music of the likes of Glenn Miller, uh, Tommy Dorsey, Jimmy Dorsey, some of the dance bands of the day, probably early Sinatra. And instead of taking a teddy bear to bed, my mom likes to tell this story where I would actually take my favorite record of the day to sleep. Well, you should know that the records back in those days were, were made of a kind of acetate glass. So if you actually crushed them, they would, they would break into shards. They were very sharp. So she got worried and at, she would wait till I fell asleep and then she would take the record away and um, just uh, until the next day, I guess. So I guess it wasn't a, a huge surprise many years later when... Uh, I said I wanted to play the trumpet and, and ended up playing in a bunch of big bands as a professional musician. I was just coming of age in 1976. Glenn Woodcock had come onto the uh, air with his big band show. My father was already listening to lots of jazz on the radio, but he never missed the big band music on Sunday nights. And then there was also uh, uh, Phil McKellar, and who had a, a, a jazz show too and his opening music was uh, uh, big band music I think it was the uh, um, Woody Herman Thundering Herd big band version of uh, Sister Sadie um, but 
my goodness, uh, Toronto back in those days, you could get there was a theater, there was a, a concert series at Seneca College, and I I got to see Maynard's big band, I got to see uh, Buddy Rich's big band, I got to see um, the big bands of uh, Basie, very entertaining. Oh, and you could go down to uh, the um, Ontario place. At Ontario Place, there was big band concerts on, on, uh, very often on a Friday night, uh, which was uh, really great. So I couldn't wait to get to high school. I couldn't wait to play big band music. And uh, so I had to switch from clarinet to saxophone. I was uh, born actually in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is just south of Philadelphia. Uh, as I grew up, uh, in school, I started to play the trombone when I was around eight years old and uh, began studying with uh, people uh, in the area, one of which was Tony Caruso. And Tony Caruso, who was actually a trumpet player, was a member of the, uh, uh, the Caruso Brothers Band. Now, he had like four brothers and they had a, a jazz group that played around uh, in the area. Now, they didn't have a trombone player, so as I was maturing, and at about 15 years old, they asked me to come and play with them uh, as they went out in nightclubs. So, I was able to do that. And so it was a beginning for my uh, study in working in the jazz style. As I was working with the uh, Crusoe band, I started studying with Al Leopold, and uh, he, he was a fantastic uh, trombone player from that period of time. And so I was very lucky to have him. My parents were fairly old when they had me. I was the youngest of five boys. So they used to listen to a lot of swing and big band music. That was their music of their time. So in our house, I grew up listening to Nat King Cole and Glenn Miller and Count Basie and Duke Ellington and really got to love the music. So it was kind of the music I grew up with, as well as the music of my brothers, which was from the 60s and 70s. Right. But uh, I it always felt like home to me, because I guess it was from my home. My parents listened to it. That's what they would choose to put on when they had a choice to put on music. On the hi-fi. <laughs> That's right. We had a giant record player that was probably six feet long with stereos yeah. built in, and the records were held right inside. Yeah, we had that too. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. So that's what I grew up listening to. And then uh, I started playing the trumpet in school and I had a wonderful music program at Northern Secondary School. And we had some amazing big bands and we always entered the Canadian Stage Band Festival. And I got a wide range of music exposure doing that. And I loved to do it. I think about, you know, what it's like as a singer being backed by, you know, 16 musicians what that felt like. I had, I had no experience with big band music at all, at all. We didn't listen to it. And we listened to, you know, Frank Sinatra and, and um, Johnny Mathis, uh, classical opera, but not big band. So I didn't have any, any background in it at all. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is amazing. As a, as a kid uh, in early high school and things, I used to watch and, and well, listen to the, um, the Boston Pops broadcasts on Sunday nights. And they played uh, a lot of jazz arrangements. This was symphonic music, but still they were playing jazz arrangements. And a lot of them were Duke Ellington arrangements. And so I, as, a, as a youngster, I, I became acquainted with Duke Ellington's music. And then, of course, I started buying recordings and, and listening to it. And then one day in English class, I remember I was in grade 10, our English teacher came into class crying. And he just made his way very slowly to the front of the room, sat down, and for the next hour, told us all about Duke Ellington. It was the, it was the day that Duke died. And he was so passionate about, about this man's music and the beauty and the creativity that he had brought to the jazz scene, the big band scene. Um, and we all sat and listened spellbound as he told us all about his hero, Duke Ellington. That's stayed with me all these years. And I still, to this day, of course, love the Duke's music. And um, Brian, 
other than being in the stage band in high school, what instrument were you playing in the stage band? I, I was a trumpet player in high school. You were the trumpet, okay. And was that your only exposure to big band or did you hear any of that at home or like, was there no. none of that, right? My mother listened to the magic of Montavani. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I like, I love jazz and, and the, the guy who was my mentor was Brian's younger brother, Dave Carr. He was oh, my really? complete, he was my music mentor. He taught me piano lessons. I jam with the guy constantly and he went through the Humber program. So any exposure I had to jazz, it was all Brian's younger brother. And what was your brother on piano, Brian? Yeah, he was, he was on the uh, piano at Humber college Yeah, and he graduated, but he decided rather that he didn't want to go as a professional musician. He went into the ministry, but still uses his musical ability in the ministry. And what about you, Henry? What, when were you first, you know, sort of enlightened to big band music? So I was playing clarinet through high school. And when I was in Sejep in Montreal, I switched over to saxophone. And that's when I started playing in a big band. And then I took a year off. And then I went and did my bachelor's of music at McGill. And during that time, I was playing big band all the time and, and grew to love the music. And that's where I met uh, Jeff and Pam Fong when I was at McGill and Rick Blechta, right. who uh, all joined the band, not original members, but many years later when each of them moved to, to Toronto at different times. And they're now key musicians, you know, members of the band today. Yeah. So when you were young, you weren't really listening to it. It was through school and through your experiences in, in bands at school that you, in university, that you really yeah. found out about it. Yeah. Yeah. My experience growing up was mostly polkas and waltzes and i was like <laughs> playing in the premier polka band in montreal a wedding band about seven years ago i gave myself a personal challenge i decided that i was going to sing all my songs with the advocates without my charts that meant making sure i had the lyrics memorized to every tune and that's a lot of lyrics but what it did was it allowed me to put away my stand and step out in front of the band and sing to the audience. It kind of freed me in a way. It also made me focus on the lyrics and think about the stories that the songs are telling. And that in turn allowed me to relate more to the audience to sing to them, to connect with them. It also gave me the freedom to listen to the band more. So instead of looking at my chart and trying to find my lyrics, I found myself listening more, which is a great opportunity. One of the tunes we chose for our CD is And All That Jazz. It's great. It's from a musical. My background is in music theater. I'm not a dancer, but I still can feel the music. And I took that song. I worked hard to memorize the lyrics because it's a very wordy song. But we started performing it. The band sounds great. I love the introduction, the lead up to when I come in, the whole feel of it. There are a bunch of key changes in it um, that just give it... Um, and electricity. There's two things that originated the big band. One was, Brian Kyle will remember this, the church had a band back when I was in high school that I started with Dave Kai, which is Brian Kai's younger brother. And we, right. it was all, it was an all Japanese, you know, Canadian band from, with kids from the church. We played homemade charts that Dave Kai made like we used to do the hockey night in Canada theme. We, and we scrambled through some charts. I stole the chart from my high school. And we had that church for about, we had that band for about three years. Peter Watanabe was in that band. Right. That's right. Uh, and, and we had that band for two or three years and then it disbanded. And so we were playing jazz regularly there. Once we graduated, we kept that combo going and then Nina joined us and started, we play jazz standards yeah. from the American songbook. We would play tunes. 
and we would play on a regular basis just to work our other side of the brain from our law practice during the you know our day job and and it was when you came up to me the way you pitched it was well henry we already have a rhythm section all we need is some more horns we have a singer we have a rhythm section you know <laughs> and, and, and so then we started putting people together we already had a core of a band just from people we knew and that's that's how that's how it came to be we just started putting all these people together henry you named the band i'm sure it was your idea it yeah it was it was really corny and you know the advocates you know play on us being advocates and oh, yeah. uh, i i remember i was like uh no, <laughs> no <I don't laughs> like that. yeah but it totally yeah. stuck it's the best name This is uh, my story about getting into the band. I remember in uh, 2002, I was attending uh, these jazz improvisation workshops that Peter Smith um, was putting on. I, I found out later that Peter Smith was uh, a saxophone player in the Advocats big band. And uh, these uh, workshops occurred at the Japanese United Church. And uh, one day Peter turned to me, he said, hey, you know, we actually have an opening in the trumpet section. Would you like to come out? Um, I was really uh, excited at uh, this opportunity. And I remember coming out and, you know, hearing, uh, uh, there was just so much sound, you know, uh, all of the different sections, uh, all of these uh, powerful trumpet players with, um, who projected so well. And so I remember just like attending uh, trying to read some of these charts and just doing my best and um, I was really pleased to hear back from Peter with a formal invitation to join the band uh, so it was a, a real thrill for me and I remember as I joined the band I thought uh, this is amazing because now I have an opportunity to, do, to be a part of the big band tradition and to be a part of the Advocates tradition a band that has been around since 1991 and then at church, Brian Fugazala formed this church uh, big band, and we had fun there doing that as well. And then later on, Brian Fugazala and Henry Gluck decided that, oh, they're going to form the Advocates big band, and they're going to play for the fundraiser for the Momiji Seniors Home. And we played our first gig in 1991, and the rest is history. Um, I joined the Advocates. Uh... You know, I think it's probably about 10, 10 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago now. I had been playing uh, trombone, valve trombone, with a big band in the Oshawa area and was looking for more of a challenge. And uh, one of my dearest friends uh, who ran this big band in Toronto, and he, he said, he had always said, you're welcome to come out. So I phoned him and said, can I come out? And he said, yeah, in fact, we're playing uh, at a club in Toronto tonight, so why don't you come sit in? I said, well, yes, I'm not that confident with my skills, uh, so, but I would love to come and listen. He said, no, just come and sit in for one tune, just one tune, and we'll make it an easy one. So I said, okay, sure, I could do that. So I came and sat in for, he said, just start, play the first tune with us, and then you can go sit down. So I said, great, okay, thanks. So I did, and it seemed to go well. And then I went to get up and he just motioned me to sit down and, and he said, no, I forgot to tell you, you're playing the rest of the set with us. So you get to play the next 30 tunes. So I was a little nervous. Um, I should have known coming from a good friend that he would do that. Just as we reached retirement and our daughter, Erica Rahm, who is a uh, famous violinist here in in Toronto, uh, she called and she sounded very upset and we wondered what was going on and she said, I'm pregnant and, and there are three in there. Three? She had triplets. Unreal. Triplets. Well, so we decided, uh, Betsy and I decided to move to Toronto uh, so that we could be there to assist her and her family in bringing up the, the triplets. Um, so we did that. And uh, as I got here, I also looked around for various people, met people to perform with. And eventually, uh, uh, I was really fortunate to get a, a chance to work with 
the advocates. I've always been interested in writing and arranging my own music. And then when I was at Humber, I had a tough time deciding between concentrating on playing all the time or learning how to write and expand my abilities with writing and arranging. So I kind of tried to split both, which was difficult, and people always picked on me for that because it's not easy to try and do both. But uh, I ended up studying arranging with Dave Stilwell and then with Ron Collier. And Ron Collier, I don't know if you remember him or knew him, but he was an amazing arranging teacher and an amazing musician, played with the CBC Radio Orchestra, and he went to work with Duke Ellington for a couple of years and wrote for his band which was a phenomenal experience because I got to learn from him about what Duke Ellington's band was like. And he had a course called The Music of Duke Ellington, which I had to take because it was too interesting to not take. Yes. <laughs> all the stories of being with the band and what all the guys were like and what the music was like. And it was just jaw dropping. I wish I had been able to record the whole course. Yeah. And then he also taught uh, big band arranging. So I took big band arranging with Ron and this project actually, A Foggy Day was my first assignment. We had to do four big band arrangements with him for the course. And the first one, he wanted us to do a transcription and arrangement. Right. So I can't really take credit for the whole arrangement because it's really kind of one third of the Count Basie Orchestra and then it's also me interpreting what they wrote and then Ron Collier fixing what I didn't get right. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to tell me how to write for big bands and what what to do with the lead trombone and what, how to get a kitchen sink voicing for the ending because right. he thought it would sound really nice with a big full chord there like Rob McConnell used to call the kitchen sink chord. Yeah. So that's what we threw in at the end. But that was really, although I had done some arranging, that was really getting my feet wet with the big band. What's special about uh, this band, in my opinion, is uh, the sense of camaraderie uh, within the band. Um, people are so encouraging and helpful, and um, you know we all feel like we're in this together, trying to do our best to interpret this music um, in the fashion in which it was meant to be played. I loved this band from the first note I heard them play, and I, I love them still. A great group of people, and fun and great music. So, piano players have lots of equipment. I have a day job, so I, what I usually do is load the trunk of the car the night before. And on this particular occasion, that's exactly what I did. In the trunk, piano, check. Amplifier, check. Stand for the piano, check. Handbag, check. Finally, handcart, check. Next morning after coffee, off to work I go. So it's the end of the workday, but I, I drive to the club and I arrive just after our drummer John, who's coming with their van. And we have a quick chat with a bit of a joke because the piano player and the drummer always have the most equipment at first in, last out, and we sometimes joke, we should have been flute players. So I carry everything into the club, and then, because I, I know time is pressing, I order some dinner, and then I take a second look at everything. Uh-oh, it looks like something's missing. The bag, a carefully packed bag of music that I need for that evening is sitting in the kitchen where I carefully left it the night before. I call my supportive spouse. There is not time to drive back to home or to get retrieve the music. She says, oh, let's put it in a cab. So she orders a cab and that's that. So I'm finally set up. It's 10 minutes before our start time. I'm starting to get a little bit anxious. Uh-oh. Then I get a text and the cab is outside. 
Somehow, everything all comes together at this point. I look at Pam, our leader. She counts the downbeat. One, two, three, everyone's focused, and the power of the big band music takes over. The evening begins. You know, I really love uh, ballad material, and one of the ballads that uh, actually appears on our new album in full swing is uh, I Remember Clifford. Um, this is a song written by Benny Golson, uh, dedicated to Clifford Brown, and Jeff Fong uh, takes uh, a flugelhorn solo on this chart. And what I love about that song is not only the, the textures um, that uh, come across in the actual uh, performance of the song with, with all of the instruments, but also Jeff's uh, expressive uh, voice on flugelhorn, uh, the warmth uh, in his sound, I think, is just uh, really something to um, to really appreciate. This was potentially, uh, it could have been a terrible disaster, but I will call it a disaster well averted. One night several years ago, for one of our first Monday of the month performances, at the time at 744, Rick Blair, our bass player, was unable to attend the gig. So he did, as he should, he arranged for a sub. We all arrived and started setting up. No sub, no bass player. We could not reach him. We were getting worried. It happened that that night I had some friends who had come to hear the band, one of whom had never heard the Advocats play before and is a bass player with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. His name's Chaz Elliott. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could ask Chaz if he'd sit in with the band. But we didn't want to do that. It was a lot to ask of him, and here he'd come to listen to the band. Anyhow, the clock ticked closer to 7.30, and we were worried. And we decided, yes, I would go and ask him. So I marched over to Chaz, and I said, Chaz, I know it's your first time hearing the band, but is there any chance you would be willing to sit in with us tonight because our bass player's sub is missing in action and we can't play without a bass player? He looked at me and he said, do you have charts? I said, yes, we have charts. He said, okay. So he went home and he got his bass and he came back and he set up on the stage and he took those charts and he knocked it out of the ballpark. He was fantastic and he really saved us. I'd like to talk about why I like playing a big band, particularly with the advocates. First of all, it is a fantastic group of people and even without the music, it would be worthwhile just to meet and socialize. To me, big band music combines two very interesting skills. First of all, the technical ability to read and play, combined with the ability to understand concepts of jazz and improvisation. Every time I go to a rehearsal or performance, I can learn from my bandmates. There's hardly a time when I don't walk away without having learned yet another lesson. It's a great combination of having elements that I feel I understand to do well, but at the same time getting an opportunity to continuously learn and be challenged. So being part of the Advocates Big Band and being part of the album In Full Swing has helped me to bring some of this music to our audience. I've been playing with them for five and a half years now and it's been a great experience and I, I hope to continue on with it because it's so much fun and we enjoy playing for people out there uh, like at the Duke uh, restaurant. Something that I've really enjoyed while being an advocate is the evolution of the different solo voices within the band. When you look at each and every section, there are a number of dynamic um, soloists um, that also appear actually on our recording in full swing. And it's a, it's a special thing to be able to um, express your own individuality while serving the music and still being a part of this collective thing, this, this band. I love listening to it. When I heard the recording on the CD, it brings back all kinds of memories about playing with the band. I love a lot of different styles of music, but I really miss the big band a lot. 
Yeah. The, the Advocats was, in particular, I love any big band, but the Advocats was always such a fun, not only musical, but fun place to be. I, yeah. I can't recall it ever being not fun. Yeah. There was always good musicians, but no matter who the good musicians were, you had a great time. People are always cracking jokes and yeah. enjoying each other's company and yeah. enjoying each other's solos and what went on in the band. And yeah. it never seemed like a rehearsal was work of any kind. It was always more just fun. Good. And the gigs, of course, were the same. The gigs were, other than having to play a solo on a foggy day, they were usually just, <laughs> they were usually just fun. I loved the gigs that we did. I remember doing the Japanese Cultural Center gigs. And yes. The, the, G, the Beaches Jazz Festival was a lot yeah. of fun. For many years. I think the band has been involved in many uh, life moments and the band I think has survived for as long as it has because it's a real community. So part of that community or the extended community is our friend Avi Sladovnik. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the few road trips that we did. An 18 piece band, we drove to Montreal and we played at Avi Sladovnik's <laughs> wedding. And he was a, a big fan of Gershwin and we introduced uh, Sing 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 with uh, the intro to Rhapsody in Blue, uh, just as a tribute to him. And I think he may have even sat in on that tune. So that's the wedding aspect of it. And other life moments were playing at Dan Williams' funeral. For me, mm -hmm. that was one of the m most moving experiences in the big band. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that Dan was dying. D Dan was the ro uh, brother of Rob. And uh, Dan had played in the, in the band trombone. He knew he was dying and he knew, his wife knew that uh, they wanted the band to be part of the uh, celebration. Dan was at that time a young man, a school teacher. The church was packed. So the weeks before that, I happened to be playing at an Elvis convention north of Toronto. And I mentioned with one of the fellow musicians I was playing to Paul Ashwell uh, that you know, we're going to be playing at this funeral that is anticipated. We don't know when it is. And I asked Paul Ashwell whether he would write something for the band. And Paul is a well-known Canadian composer. He has written for TV and movies. And he was playing this gig with me. And he said, absolutely. And I remember Paul working on this. And then we get the call that Dan has passed away. And the funeral is a few days later. I call Paul and he says, well, I sketched something out and he says, I'll, I'll get it done. I said, we have a rehearsal. I think it was a Monday night and he, and he, because the funeral was Tuesday morning and he says, I'll try to have it done for the rehearsal. And I remember him walking into the rehearsal, us getting this chart, us working up the chart. It's not an easy chart. It's a beautiful chart. It's a beautiful chart. And, and, and the band has now played that chart so many times. And it's always moving. It's always moving whenever we play it. And so those are two of my really moving experiences with the band. Yeah. I always remember the first gigs, like the first time we played Eat to the Beat at Castle Loma. And mm. we just, and, and it wasn't too popular then. So by the third year we played it, you couldn't walk through the halls. It was so crowded. But that first year we played it, I remember that distinctly where the food was just unbelievable. We couldn't get the band back after breaks because everybody was <laughs> you know people are spewing desserts through their horns and stuff no one cared <laughs> um, i remember the first time we did the beaches and we had to try to set up on that sidewalk and we had no idea how to set up the pa and we had no idea how to squeeze the band in there was another big band that showed up do you remember that henry yeah. i wasn't there the first two years i was in pei then i did oh, okay. was that the the mississauga the mississauga yeah. Other band showed up on the, the um, queen, yeah. That's right, in the same spot, saying, "Oh, we're on," and it was kind of like so we had to share the sidewalk with them, and then we we played alternate sets and stuff. Most recently, uh, the Advocates recorded a CD, and I got to play Drum and Man on on one of the, the tracks, and that's uh, a Gene Krupa song, of course. And Gene is a, a huge influ influence of, of mine as well, and. Uh, and when I was recording that, I was trying to copy Gene to a certain point, but still put my own twist on it, and, but, but while still giving 
you know, the, the right flavor and the, the respect to what, what Gene Krupa did on the, on the track. But uh, very proud of it, how it turned out, and uh, I hope uh, people enjoy it. The band was playing at the Rex Hotel in downtown Toronto, which is a big gig. This is an important jazz club. We were playing on a Saturday afternoon. I got all my stuff ready to play on stage, trumpet, music stand, music, mutes, everything. And it was time to tune up, and I blew into my trumpet, and air wouldn't go into the trumpet. Air wouldn't come out of the trumpet, obviously, too. Something was stuck in it, and I had no idea what that could be. So I turned the trumpet around and looked down the bell, and I could see something black stuck way in. At that point, I looked down at my trumpet stand and noticed that there's a uh, rubber stopper at the end to protect the inside of the trumpet from the metal tube that goes up into it, and it wasn't there. Obviously, it's down my trumpet bell. And just so you know what we're talking about, this is my new trumpet stand, and the top cannot come off. In any event, on my old stand, this rubber stopper and it was a different manufacturer and a much cheaper stand, had gone and gotten stuck in the bell. I could not get it out. It wouldn't. I couldn't blow it out. I couldn't grab it because it was too far inside. And at that point, I came up with a bright idea. If I could find a metal coat hanger, I could straighten it out, put a little hook at the end because I had a pair of pliers. That was something good. And I thought, we're in the Rex Hotel. The Rex Hotel will have coat hangers. I went to the manager who said, nope, no coat hangers. Now what am I going to do? And I ran out of the club, and I started going to various clothing stores, of which there are many on Queen Street, and nobody had one of these cheap metal coat hangers. Nothing. And I'm getting increasingly frantic when I turned a corner about four blocks away, and there was a dry cleaner Fortunately, when I went in, they had the cheap metal coat hangers. I said, could I have one? They charged me $2, and I wasn't about to quibble, so I threw a toonie down on the counter, ran out of the store, ran back to the club, straightened this thing out, put a hook in it. The band was just finishing up the first set by that point, and it took another 10 minutes of fiddling, but eventually I managed to snag this uh blue piece of, or black piece of rubber hard enough that I could yank it out and of course the band was crowded around asking what was going on and having a good laugh at my expense. It was one of those things that musicians have nightmares about and at the time it was not very funny but occasionally I can kind of see the humor in the situation after three or four years. Your, your father was our biggest fan Nina. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen a prouder man. Yeah when he used to show up to those gigs. He just beamed. You know, well, what's started. really, I don't know if, if you ever saw this, but my dad was interviewed in London um, because he was singing in um, restaurants. You know, he'd go in with a bass player and a piano player. Anyhow, at some point he was interviewed, you know, how did you, how did you end up doing this? I mean, he'd been in music theater before. He said, well, you know, I went to Toronto, I went to the Beaches Jazz Festival and I saw my daughter singing with the band. I thought, well, if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> that's, that's how he, what a competitive guy. <laughs> well, you, you inspired him, Nina. That's great, yeah. you know. The producers came up with this fantastic idea of the big band exchange. And one of the things that I've, that we've been um, talking about is what is so great about the Sunday Serenades, about that program, uh, the event for, for us from the band's perspective and how we feel it is for the public. When Pam and I were living in Montreal, uh, it occurred to me that, that the Sunday Serenades here in Toronto was very reminiscent of a very old tradition of concerts in the park, which um, actually have been going on for ages, probably starting in the late 1800s. And, uh, and at the time, it, it offered the community um, a chance to go out and hear free music and uh, just enjoy, enjoy hearing a concert. 
And I think the Sunday serenades is actually, you know, encouraging that tradition. And they've actually changed it to allow for dancing and to make it more of a, a participatory event rather than just sitting down and, and looking at a concert. So I think, I think that's a great thing. One of the things that always stood out to me, it's free. Anyone can come. You don't need a ticket. You don't need a reservation. You just show up. So it's open to the whole population, whoever can get there and enjoy it. And I feel that that just brings more music to so many more people in the city than would otherwise have that opportunity. I remember focusing on some particular dancers and watching them as they moved throughout the uh, throughout the square. It was it was it was beautiful. I mean, that's been a consistent feature of the Sunday Serenade uh, program over the years. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of performing there a number of times, and along with so many positive things, it's really been about the attendance of people who come to listen to big band music, dance to big band music. And there have been nights we've gone there and the weather's cooperated beautifully. It's been sunny and, and bright and warm. Other times it's been a little on the cool sides or maybe threatening rain, but regardless, people show up because they love this music and so many of them love to dance to it. And that makes it so great for us to be there. Yeah. Um, but I've played in a lot of band shells in small towns throughout Ontario and even out, um, out west and, and th places like that. And the thing about, uh, I, I love about those band shell things is the sense of community. Everybody in the town comes out. And the North York one, I've only played it a couple of times, but it, uh, it had the same kind of feel to it. And it kind of brings, you know, the, the community surrounding that venue together in, in a really cool way. I got there early the last time we played there and just sat and had a coffee and just enjoyed the the open air and watch people gather and yakking and talking. And uh, it's just such a great vibe. And then we pick that up as a band. It energizes us. And then I think we, we give that back to the audience as uh, evidenced by the, uh, by the dancing and the, you know, the good time that people seem to be having. I love it. Everything ran so smoothly. The sound was fantastic fantastic for us as a band on that stage but also for the people out listening and one of the one of the kind of nice treats we got um, as a result of that event was a, a bond we have with the sound guy from the event he and his wife have become lo or loyal followers of our band and come to almost all our gigs lovely people and real big band enthusiasts and that's kind of a just just a, a nice result. As many of you are probably aware, um, the um, Mel Asman Square um, does include a clock tower uh, with a working bell. And this bell goes off every hour on the hour. And um, North York uh, concert band, whom I played with for many years, who Don actually, who's not here, played with as well. And that's how we know each other. Um, it's played there many times. And every time we played there without fail, that bell would go off right in the middle of the tune. It happened every time. And this went on for years. And then I, I think it might have been the last year that I played there with that band. Uh, we played a song. It was a fairly long song, as I recall. And it was just getting close to, I think, 8 o'clock. And you could kind of feel the other musicians aware that 8 o'clock was coming up. And they were all worried that the bell was going to go off again right in the middle of the song. and we get to the end and we play the last note and no sooner does the conductor cut us off than that bell starts ringing and the sigh of relief just was palpable. Everyone in the, in the band kind of could feel it. At the beginning of World War II, my father, who was drafted into the army from uh, Youngstown, Ohio, was stationed in Toledo, Ohio. He was part of the draft board. They were trying to draft uh, young men into the army at that time. My mom was still in high school in Toledo and she was part of the committee that would uh, organize the dances and they would invite the local servicemen to the school dances. In those days, people had dance cards and 
My mom had her dance card with all the lines on it for all the different types of songs that were going to be performed. And my dad took the card and signed every line. And that's how they met. And every year we always did a swing dance, which was always my favorite thing of the year. So we, even though most high school bands usually only learn about three to five tunes and put them on for a concert, we would learn a whole night of swing tunes to put on for a dance for the parents. Wow. But it was, and that was always my favorite night of the year because we would do all the classic big band tunes and got to play things like Little Brown Jug and In the Mood and wonderful, wonderful songs. And did you say that was for the parents? Yeah, we put it on at the open house and right. they usually invited the parents and kind of advertised it as a swing dance for the parents. And people would come and they would dance, which was amazing. amazing. It was wonderful to play and have people dance. That was the first time I think I ever played and it wasn't really your parents and other people's parents watching, where it was just people dancing and having a great time, which seemed to make the music come alive. Playing for dancers is an incredible experience. I've always found it so inspiring to play for uh, a dance floor full of dancers. Um, I think just the idea of playing music that bring people so much joy that they need to express that joy through movement is something that um, is just an incredible thing to be a part of. And there have been occasions where um, dancers have really been cooking on the dance floor and the band has really been burning. And uh, I admit to, uh, on probably at least one occasion, losing my place in the music because I've been paying more attention to people on the dance floor than what's, uh, what's on my uh, music stand. What I love about big band music are the connections. The connections between me and my fellow performers, but mostly between the audience and us. I've done gigs where the crowd is totally engaged with what's going on, mouthing the lyrics to songs, tapping their toes, but the absolute best is when you get up and dance. And this was at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Centre up on, is it near Winford Drive when it was yeah. there? Yeah. Right. And um, the curtains are closed, the band is set up behind the curtains, and there's an MC getting the audience ready to say, okay, here we are, led by our own Brian Fukuzawa, the Advocates Big Band. And I can't remember whether we start with String of Pearls, but at least that's the tune that's in my head. And the whole hall is dark, the crystal ball starts spinning, the curtains open up, we start playing, and the dance floor fills immediately from that first tune, the dance floor, and I'm there like, okay, I feel like I'm in some kind of a movie score yes. or something like that. It was magic, it was magic. What a treat to be able to play for an audience, to watch people dancing. We played in Mount Lassman Square for the uh, Sunday Serenade a few years ago and uh, just had such a great time playing in the sunshine, watching people dance, having a good time. What could be better than that? Now you know the story of the Advocats Big Band. Hopefully you have a good sense of who we are and what makes us so enthusiastic about big band music. Thanks so much for watching. We extend our heartfelt thanks to North York Arts, the Department of Canadian Heritage, Art of Festivals and Smile Theatre for supporting live music and for supporting our band and the other three in this, the Big Band Exchange. We are disappointed at not being able to play for you live this summer in the Sunday Serenades at Mel Lastman Square, but are delighted to have had the wonderful opportunity to share this hour online with you. If you've enjoyed listening to music from our new album, In Full Swing, you can purchase a CD or download card directly from our website at advocatesbigband.com slash ourwares, and we'll ship it right to your door. You can also download our entire album from iTunes. And when venues eventually open up and we can perform together again, we intend to have our much-anticipated CD launch. So keep in touch with us. Sign up on our website at www.advocatesbigband.com for our monthly email. In fact, we are always happy to hear from you. 
so reach out to us at contact at advocatesbigband.com anytime. Stay safe. We look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Let me say for the more.